Good morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech on a given morning during the coronavirus crisis. And we have, uh, for what do you want to call it, moral spiritual support with us today, Rabbi Itchil Krasnjanski here on Community Matters. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. So nice to see you. Thank you, Jay. It's nice to talk to you as always in this new setting as well. In yeah, we're doing uh, pretty much all our guests are coming on by remote. If CNN and MSNBC can do it, we can do it. In fact, I think they may have learned it from us. There you anyway, go. Uh, <laughs> so Rabbi, uh, you know, things must have changed uh, for Chabad and for the Jewish community over the past few weeks with the, with the shelter in and uh, the rule against, uh, you know, uh, gatherings. And uh, I would like to ask you about that. Um, it must have a profound effect because one of the things about uh, the Jewish people and Judaism and certainly the, the Jewish religious experience is you get together with people. You are close. You are, you know, person to person. <clears throat> and here you can't really do that. So what's happening? Well, uh, good question. We uh, adapt uh, as, as, as needed. But uh, philosophically for a moment before I, I get to the pragmatic, is that Judaism, while there's a great emphasis on, like you mentioned, gatherings, especially like uh, Passover, which is coming up, the Seder is the time when family and extended family and friends come together and gather. Um, and there's actually the expression in the Talmud, Berev Am Hadras Melech that uh, the beauty for the king is in the presence of multitudes. The more people come together, the, the, the greater the, uh, the uh, not only the event, but the, the celebration and the, and, and the glory for Hashem, for God. However, interestingly enough, while Judaism places this emphasis on you know, on, on public form. As a matter of fact, uh, prayer, as, as we all know, cannot be done unless you have a minion. Uh, I mean, communal prayer cannot be done unless you have a quorum of 10, of 10 people. Otherwise, you can't say the Kaddish prayer or, or, uh, or, or prayers like that. So there is that public uh, aspect of, uh, of Jewish observance. However, What's interesting is there's another aspect in Judaism, which it, which is the personal and the individual. When God came down on Mount Sinai, where it all began and gave us the Ten Commandments, the first words out of God's mouth were, I am the Lord, your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt. And as the commentaries point out, your God in the singular in Hebrew, the words that is used is, is the singular expression. Even though God was talking to millions of people, to all the Jewish people at the time, nevertheless, God uses the singular because Judaism is a per very personal relationship with God. All of the commandments uh, are, are, are there to awaken within us the personal core spark and so therefore when we are in a situation like today when we cannot come together uh, in prayer or in celebration so now by default we we fall back on the personal track the interpersonal uh, emphasis in judaism man in general is a social being by, 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 by design, that's how God created us. We cannot live on an island all to ourselves. <clears throat> Even if we're lucky to live on this island, we share it with many million, with over a million people uh, plus tourists. However, even though there is that aspect within us that uh, seeks to relate to other people and, and connect to other people, there's also the, the, the individual in his own world, the personal. Uh, the true you that's not visible to the outside world that resides within you. 
as we all know that within us, our personality, our, we all have a, a soul, and the soul is the spark of life within us. We all have a godly soul, uh, which is which is innately godly and good. And successful living is actually being in touch with who we are on on the deepest levels. And and a lot of Judaism is about uh, becoming aware of that and giving us the tools how we can uh, be in touch with ourselves, to know ourselves. And even though it sounds very simplistic, but um, but uh, I once read that they um, that they once did a study and they asked people to describe themselves and define themselves, and they had all these different uh, multiple choices. And the and the interesting things what interesting thing was most people describe themselves so differently than how other people knew them. So being in touch with yourself and allowing for your inner self to uh, color your whole being and to express itself involves a lot of work on the self, personal uh, introspection. And... uh, and Pesach, while normally it is celebrated, like we said before, with family, and it's a fun time, and it's a joyous time, it's a time of celebration. We commemorate our history and the miracles of, um, that took place in the past. But uh, on a deeper level, when we are alone and reflecting these ideas, it's a lot more powerful. And as a matter of fact, in the mystical teachings of the Torah, in the Hasidic writings, you find a, a, a very interesting explanation about the whole idea of the exodus of Egypt. Passover is celebrated because we commemorate how our ancestors left Egypt several thousand years ago, and we gained freedom. And um, we say in the Haggadah, that's the uh, that's the uh, storybook of Pesach that we use at the Seder that in every generation, a person has to envision as if they themselves are going out of Egypt. It's not just commemorating history, something that took took place way back when, but we have to uh, find relevance in the story and apply it to our own lives. So in the mystical teachings, in the Hasidus, it's explained, the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, which in Hebrew also means uh, uh, boundaries, limitations, and every single person is confined by different limitations, weaknesses, challenges, obstacles, and difficulties. And the idea of going out of Egypt is the ability and the and the work to transcend these uh, limitations and to be able to rise above them. And that's why uh, the exodus of Egypt is such a relevant uh, story. In fact, the, Talmud, the Torah tells us that every day we have to remember our exodus of Egypt because the definition of life is being able, finding the inner strength and the inner ability to be able to overcome obstacles. Most of the obstacles and the most difficult obstacles we, we, we look to overcome are not the external ones that are imposed to us uh, by external circumstances, but the inner ones, the ones, uh, the, the character flaws and or, or every person's uh, inner work is different. But uh, the, the ultimate goal in successful living and fully living is to be able to rise above them and to be able to transcend them. So Pesach is a very, Passover is a very relevant uh, holiday and celebrating it alone actually gives us the opportunity to, to look at these ideas and to reflect upon them. Mm. Well, I, uh, unpacking that a little bit, uh, one thing I, my, uh, I wanted to mention is that in the, in the, in the, in the, the service, the prayer service, there's a thing called the silent Amida, which where you you pray to God yourself silently. You don't make a sound. Uh, in my in my upbringing as a conservative Jew, I I 
I could read uh, out of the prayer book or not. I could just think too. I could commune with God if I liked, or I could read out of the prayer book. Anyway, bottom line is uh, and I, what you're saying and what that prayer is saying is that every individual person has a direct connection with God uh, if he chooses. And uh, this, this is very important because it's just the flip side of the, the notion of minion and gathering. Um, right. as you can do it, you, maybe you should do it yourself. You should have a, a sort of, um, you know, a, a two-pronged approach to it. One is you should be with your members of the community with the minion or larger for, you know, every single festival, every single activity. You're, you're with a, a lot of people and you're, you're close to them, uh, sharing it with them. And, and sometimes you're all by yourself and it's just you and him or her. Uh, so it's very interesting that, uh, that you know, you, you've unpacked it's, it's, that. It's, par it's paradoxical. <laughs> yes, it is. But, but it's okay. You can walk and chew gum right. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, other, the other thing, the other thing is, um, you know, Passover is very interesting. The Passover, yeah, you know, traditionally it's, uh, you know, it's the Seder and uh, people get together. It's not a minion. It may not be as big as a minion, but it's a family anyway. And it's, uh, you know, several people together all going through the rituals that have existed for thousands of years and reinforcing, retelling the story out of the, the Haggadah and all that. Um, but but what you just said really is very interesting is because you can have a Seder without inviting anyone to your home. You can have a Seder essentially alone uh, and you can use the, the silent communication or, or the personal, I should say, the personal communication with God as part of that Seder. So Judaism is flexible in this way, isn't it? And, um, you know, mother, rather, uh, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and uh, you can find space to invent. Um, I, guess, I guess the problem is that not everybody, not every rabbi feels the way you do. Uh, there are super orthodox rabbis uh, in, in Jerusalem, for example, who are in contention with the police because, uh, you know, the rule in Israel is don't have gatherings and they want to have a gathering anyway. They have a minion all the time. And, and it's a little cat and mouse game where the police are trying to find the minion and separate them for purposes of dealing with the coronavirus. <laughs> it's very interesting. And uh, they'll come I, up with some. If I, if I, if I, um, I think that actually, if, the, if that is the case, uh, it is a minority, a very small minority. Most Jewish people, most observant Jewish people, most Orthodox or ultra Orthodox, whatever label you want to give them, are actually very, very careful and cautious. And all the synagogues are closed down now. There is no communal prayers. And most of the. Uh, communal celebrations in Jewish life has taken on a whole new form. Um, so, uh, and, and, and as it should be, as it must be to, uh, you know, the Torah uh, gives the highest, highest priority to preserving life and to health and to uh, watch one's health. And this is apparently how God wants us to celebrate now. The question is, what is the message behind it? What, what, what is God telling us? Um, I, I once heard it explained like, with an analogy in that there was a, a, a dad or a parent once took out their child at night um, and pointed to the heavens, the young child pointed to the heavens to show, wanting to show them all the, the, the majesty of the stars in the sky at night, so beautiful. But the little kid, uh, being very, very young, just focused on the finger, looked at the dad's finger or the mother's finger, finger, not realizing that the finger was pointing heavenward. And we are like that many times. We are like that uh, little child that God is pointing, but we are fixated on the finger, on, the, on, what's ha on, on not realizing that he's pointing to something. So it's clear that God is, as we say, uh, you know, God is always communicating with us. He communicates uh, to us by everything that happens in our lives. Uh, but that's normally that's subtle, and you have to pay close attention to pick to pick up on what God is telling us. 
but sometimes God is banging on our door so loud <laughs> that that we have that we have no other choice but to stop and to ask who's there <laughs> and what's going on. So I think this these are one of those times. Yeah. And um you know it 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 would require a, you know someone a uh, much greater stature than me to be able to uh interpret and understand exactly the messages, but I think that a couple of messages are very, very clear. And uh, one of them is what we talked about is that each and every one of us <clears throat> as, a, <clears throat> as a lonely individual is really uh, critical to, to God's master plan. Uh, you know, there are certain societies where the focus is on the collective and there's no individual rights. No individual's needs are, uh, or an individual's needs are hardly taken into consideration. There are many societies that are structured that way. Then we have, for example, in our country where it's almost the opposite, where the individual rights trump the, 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 the public's rights, the public's good. Within Judaism, uh, both both are, are equally important. One does not um, uh, overshadow the other. Or one does not uproot the other. So you know, now that we're all forced to quarantine and to uh, and to stay at home, first of all, in Judaism, uh, the home has always been the epicenter of Judaism. Not, not the synagogue, not the house of worship. It was, it was the Jewish home that um, is really the secret of our survival throughout the generations. And it's all, it all happened in the home. And who we, are, you know, who we truly, truly are is really only in the home. Outside, we wear a mask. Right today we're wearing masks. It's mandatory. I was going to ask you, how about you, Rabbi? You you have a beard. I mean, you know, yeah. um, uh, an N95 is hardly going to fit around your beard. Uh, what do you well, do for that? And I, I read that there are, there are people who make tailored beards for. I mean, tailored masks for people with beards. Are you using one? Well, so far the the masks that I use are their off the shelf, run of the mill masks, but uh, they seem to work. <laughs> yeah. The other thing of interest is uh, Chabad has changed uh, its regular, you know, uh, Passover experience. Uh, traditionally, Chabad has a big seder, we invite people, including tourists, who come around, and you have a, uh, you know, fifty, sixty, hundred people come down uh, to the synagogue to uh, pray together on Passover. But you really, can't do that this year. So you have an alternative technique. Can you talk about it? Yeah, uh, so correct. Chabad is very, is known worldwide for the public gatherings that we have on Passover night. The Seder is celebrated in the you know with the community and like in, for us in Hawaii with many tourists and a typical Seder, we can have 150, 250, even more people. Uh, but this year, none of that is happening in other places around the world. Like, believe it or not, I think the largest public Seder that Chabad has is in Thailand, where they have a Seder for over 3,000 uh, backpackers who are traveling, in, uh, many, many Israelis, but also other people. But none of that is happening this year. It's, it's uh, prohibited, forbidden to be in large gatherings. It's dangerous. So everyone is going to celebrate Pesach at home, Passover at home, make a Seder. If, they, if there's family together, husband, wife, parents, and children, or close friends, will celebrate it together. Very different than uh, as it's been done uh, traditionally for many years. But uh, let, let, let me share a joke with you. Uh, that, that will. Uh, we need some levity. Exactly. <laughs> we, we, we need some levity these days. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, someone sent me an interesting joke, which read that. How interesting that Passover is being uh, canceled because of a plague. 
<laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> and, and and for those who didn't get it, on pa the whole Passover, we, we commemorate the plagues that God brought about <laughs> onto the Egyptians. And now because of a plague, we have to, uh, um, actually it's not canceled. But so this is a, this is a joke. The joke is that um, a couple of scientists were uh, experimenting and tinkering with some with nuclear fusion in the North Pole and something went terribly wrong and there was a mass, mass explosion and the heat was like beyond off the charts and they calculated and they uh, calculated that within 30 days the whole world will be uh, submerged underwater because the, all, all the ice would melt because of this heat, this accident. So they immediately sent word to all the governments around the world and all the religious leaders to tell them of what happened and uh, according, according to their calculation it's another 30 days and then it's all over. So all of the um, religious leaders gathered their people and spoke to them and said, we've all heard this terrible news. We need, we, we need to now repent because, you know, we're going to be facing our maker very soon and we'll have to come, come to God clean to go home and repent and, uh, and ask God's forgiveness. That was basically the message that they were all giving to their adherents. And then uh, the, the, the rabbis, one big rabbi, gathered all the Jews together and said, okay, my, my boy, boy chicks, my, my fellow brethren and sisters, we all heard the terrible news, and now we have 30 days to learn how to survive underwater. <laughs> Got to be flexible. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that takes so, me to something I think we so – is, are you not finished? No, what I was going to say is, you know, we're joking, and like you say, we need to have some levity here, but yeah. uh, it's a very, it's a very frightening time, and uh, our prayers go out to those. Well, let's who talk are, about New York. You have family in New York. You have friends yeah. in New York. The Chabad headquarters is in New York and yeah. in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, you must be in touch with with people. What are you hearing from the Jewish community, the Orthodox Jewish community in New York? What I'm hearing is so frightening that it's like surreal. You have, to, you have to scratch your head and say, is this really happening? Uh, firstly, the, the virus over there spread. Um, almost everyone is affected. One in two people are probably affected with the virus. Thank God, many, many, many people uh, are asymptomatic. <clears throat> they don't have symptoms, but there are many people that uh, do have symptoms and many people uh, are in the hospitals fighting for their lives. We know uh, in, in, the, in the Chabad community in New York, <clears throat> every day there are funerals, people passing away from the virus. Um, uh, mostly older people, because when they get it, it's, they don't have the immune system to fight it, but also young people are struggling with it and some have even succumbed and passed away. So it's really, really, really unbelievable, frightening. And there's a medical problem. By definition, the people you're talking about are religious by, Jewish people. Yeah. <clears throat> people, people who are, um, you know, orthodox. And right. <laughs> they must um, have a way, need a way, to somehow, somehow include this in their worldview, in their religious worldview. What are you hearing about that? What are they saying? Is this is like the issue in the Holocaust? Um, is does God want this to happen? Uh, why doesn't God stop this from happening? It seems all so terrible. Um, and how do you rationalize that with the, the Jewish approach to things? So that's a, a timeless question that has been around uh, for all time. Uh, the question of how can God allow for suffering in this world? If two things, if God is uh, indeed good, we believe God is absolutely good, and B, if God controls everything in this world, which we believe that God does, how is it, how, how can this happen? <clears throat> and we find, as our commentaries say, that Moses himself, Moshe Rabbeinu, our first Jewish leader, who took us out of Egypt and brought down the tablets uh, from Mount Sinai, gave us the Torah, himself 
grapples with that question. Uh, why do good things happen to bad people? Why is there suffering in the world? And we all know the book of Job uh, from the Old Testament, who suffered greatly. And uh, when his friends came to, uh, to comfort him and hinted that he must have done something wrong to invite God's wrath in the way it happened in his life, he rejected that because he was a good man, he was a righteous person, and he rejected the, the thinking that, uh, that suffering is a result of his punishment. So the bottom line answer that uh, the way I understand it, as it's explained in the Torah, and as I believe as every believing Jew accepts, is that there are many, many things that are beyond our comprehension. Our intellect can only go so far, can only understand so much. And if, if we think about it and we recognize that we uh, uh, as individuals are only a teeny speck in the, in, in the, in the, in the cosmos, in uh, the galaxies, in all the world, where it's like an infinitesimal speck in this whole being. So the fact that we don't understand that our finite brains cannot comprehend and it doesn't compute, uh, that's not such a, a surprising thing. The surprising thing is that God gave us a, a mind and there's so much that we could understand with our minds. But the fact that our minds can only go so far and not further that uh, is something that um, that is something that, if you think about it, one could accept, one could understand. So, in answer to your question, is we don't know. <laughs> well, here we are. We're almost at the end of our time, Rabbi. And I, I wanted to ask you one last question. Um, you know, here we are at Passover, uh, the night of the first seder is later this week. Um, you're constrained because of, you know, the gatherings rule, as, as are many, many Chabad, uh, you know, congregations around the world. Um, how are you going to celebrate Passover? Uh, ordinarily it's uh, in a group, it's, uh, but this time not, how, how are you going to do that? How is Chabad going to do that and remember these great lessons? So, we're, so for ourselves, we're going to celebrate, myself and Pro, my wife, and our youngest son is home. Usually Passover, our, our, our children and grandchildren come uh, to spend the, the holiday with us, but this year they're not. We're going, probably going to have one or two guests in our house and keep social distancing. And as we said all along, you know, um, you know what's interesting is that uh, the first Passover, when the Jews left Egypt, God told them to be quarantined in their homes. They were not to go out of their homes that night because that was the night when God uh, killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, which uh, precipitated their exodus from Egypt. So this year, we're celebrating Passover as it was celebrated the first year, the first Passover. Everyone quarantined in their home. <laughs> now, now, what's interesting is that Judaism teaches us that there's an end game to all of this. We don't just pass through this world, born and pass away, and, and, and that's the end of it. But God has a, there's a plan for, for this world. And the plan was for us human beings to uh, fix this world and elevate this world and refine this world by living elevated and refined lives. And, and the end of the journey is the coming of the Messiah, when the world will finally, uh, where Mashiach, the Messiah, will usher in the, the perfected state, the potential that we each have that's embedded in each and every one of us that at this uh, right now we are hardly accessing. When, when Mashiach comes, the world will flourish and each and every one of us will explode. The, 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 the latent uh, powers and strengths and good that we have within each and every one of us will explode. 
and that is the end game, and that is the sum total and the result of all of the good deeds that each and every one of us do every single day. So uh, the, the, the big rabbis have said for a long time that we are now in the end of times or the end of days. And in Judaism, the end of days is not something cataclysmic in the negative, but it's something very powerful and positive. And the feeling is that we're there. We're on the threshold of the redemption, which is what pa Passover celebrates. It's not just a commemoration of a, a redemption that took place in the past, but it is uh, the prayer that the complete and final redemption should come to pass in our lifetime. So we're there. Yes, and, and we should do good things. We should be good and do good and make, make mitzvah, so to speak, uh, to everybody around us. And that means uh, thinking in the larger sense for the benefit of everyone. Well, thank you so much, Rabbi. It's always great to talk to you. I want to talk to you again as, as the uh, crisis goes forward and, and have your words of encouragement and, uh, and, and spiritual light. Thank you so much. Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski, the Rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii. Aloha. Thank, thank you, Jay. Me. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure as always. Just want to say that Passover, you didn't even mention it, is this Wednesday night. It's, it begins, it's an eight day celebration. And even though we're not having a public Seder at Chabad, but we have Passover kits to go. So anyone who's in need of anything uh, Passover, like Jay, we're going to bring you some matzah later. Uh, please call us, go visit us on our website or call us at the office 808-735-8161. And we'll be more than happy to help out in whichever way we can. God bless and have a happy Passover. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Rabbi. Aloha. Shalom.